Well, welcome everyone to the session. Uh, my name is Stacey DeKelma and I am the Manager for Sector Capacity here at the Queensland Council of Social Service or QCOS as you may know us. Uh, and it's our pleasure to uh, host the session today and welcome you all really warmly into the session on a really um, critical topic. Uh, QCUS does a bit of work in strengthening governance and leadership across the sector and it's been an absolute pleasure for me to have conversations with the Australian Indigenous Governance Institute over the last few months about some of the areas that they have been focusing on and the resources um, and learnings that they have as an organisation. Uh, so it's really exciting to see this workshop come to, this webinar come to fruition because we've been chatting about quite a few different things over the the um, last few months um, and it's finally here. So welcome to the session um, and for joining us today. I'm going to be handing over to Jess and her team uh, really soon, but before we get started in um, and into the, into the content itself, I would like to acknowledge the Yuggera and Turrbal people. It's on their land that I'm sitting on today where I often do my work. I'd like to pay my respect to their elders past and present. And I'd like to extend that acknowledgement to the Durrambal people of central Queensland. It was on their land that I was born and raised and have been able to enjoy the beautiful uh, coastal um, community up there for many, many years. Uh, and as an organisation, QCOS would like to thank First Nations people for the gift of the Uluru Statement of the Heart. And as an organisation, we um, wholeheartedly support the work leading to a successful referendum to enshrine a First Nations voice to Parliament followed by Makarata and Treaty. And we really uh, thank First Nations people for the invitation to walk beside them in a movement for a better future. I extend that acknowledgement, of course, to any First Nations people we have on the line. And I would encourage you to acknowledge country in the chat when you're introducing yourself. I think that's probably enough from me because I'm really excited to hear what Jess has to say, what her team have to say. So I'm going to um, hand over to Jess to introduce herself and the work that their, uh, her organisation has been doing um, and get into the content. Thanks very much, Jess. Thanks, Stacey. Um, oh, that's a bit odd, isn't it? When you get spotlighted, your face comes up big um, on your screen as well. I'll see how I can cope with that. Hello, everyone. My name is Jess Bolger. I'm Radjuri. I grew up in country New South Wales, a little town called Tumut which is not far from Brungle Mission, where a lot of my family were. I grew up in a big, proud Aboriginal family, really lucky to know who I am, where I'm from, and to grow up with really effective elders. And, you know, not that you know it as a kid, those conversations that happen around the table at Nan's house, but um, also grew up in effective, witnessing effective community governance with lots of family members that, you know, were involved in um, the work of our, our community um, as a kid and, and growing up. I started my career as a high school visual arts teacher. That's what I thought I would do forever, but quickly realised that that's not how I wanted to have an impact for my people. And so through a few steps around the university sector, eventually found my way to the not-for-profit sector and worked at an organisation called Career Trackers, which is an internship program for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander university students. I was part of that organisation for eight years through a period of rapid growth and became comfortable with the fact that after I'd uh, led the state team and then the national team, um, that our CEO had um, started to sort of pull me out of the job I'd just gotten used to and put me onto the next challenge that the organisation was going to have. But what was lovely about that is that as you see a small not-for-profit grow, you get to engage with, well, when do we add a comms function? When do we uh, add a HR function? How do you pilot programs? How do you start new things? How do you look after um, an often young and, and fast-growing um, fast developing team. So I had some really great um, grounding in organisational growth and development. And then, of course, um, it's my privilege and, and pleasure to be the CEO of the Australian Indigenous Governance Institute. Um, I joined AIGI just 12 months ago, and I'm always, um, oh, it's always very important to me to say when I do these sort of things that I'm just 12 months into my first CEO opportunity 
Um, and while that's a, a great um, pleasure to lead an organisation like this, I'm humbled every day by the mentors, elders and communities that we get to work with. So I'm sure I'll learn um, a lot from this group today and looking forward to, to working with you. Um, thanks also, Stacey, for your acknowledgement. I'm here in Canberra in, in the spare room of my house in Gungala um, on the lands of the Ngunnawal people, um, only two hours from where I grew up. So it's lovely to, to live and work close to home, close to country. Um, and of course, extend that respect to the lands that you're all coming from um, as well. So today, um, we've had a couple of conversations with QCOS. We ran a lunch and learn session, I think you called them a few weeks back, where we walked through some of the resources that are part of the Indigenous Governance Toolkit. And what we're going to do today is go a bit deeper into that. Um, we understand that QCOS uh, really tries very hard to get resources and you know activities, uh, ways of thinking, ways of connecting out to its members. And so we want to be part of that. Um, what we'll do today is tell you a little bit about AIGI and about the way that um, we think about governance, the way that we um, frame approaches to governance to work with Indigenous organisations. And I also plan to get a little bit, you know, because you sort of come to a webinar that's got a big chunk of time in your day. You don't just want to listen to me the whole time. Um, so I thought what we would do today is try some activities as well. So we're going to um, get you guys engaged and, and talking and sharing. And we might even attempt some breakout rooms um, a little bit later on and get you talking to each other. Before I go further, though, um, I'll just um, give a shout out to a couple of team members um, Abby and Elise who are part of the call. Um, Abby, if you go ahead and introduce yourself. Abby will um, talk a little bit more later on. Um, Elise, I, we've sort of allowed to be a bit in the background today, but you could say hello to Elise. Thanks, Jess. Hi, everyone. Thanks so much for jumping on. So as Jess said, my name's Abby. I'm a proud Gomorrah woman who grew up on Radri country in the Central West of New South Wales in Orange, but I'm joining um, on a Wobbegal land today in Newcastle. So uh, my background is originally in communications and marketing. Prior to being at I AIGI, I was at the ABC in their kids team. So if you guys are up to date with Play School, um, one of my major projects was working on Kaya, who is now a full-time member on the ABC team. Um, Kaya was my main project. And once she kind of hit the screens and the shops, I realized that I really miss working directly with community. So Kaya is um, the ABC's first ever Aboriginal doll who's a full-time Play School member. So they had appearances with Indigenous dolls in the past, but Kaya is there full-time. So I met Jeff, yeah, about five years ago at Career Trackers, a not-for-profit organization. Um, and loved working with students in high school and also within university, but I guess was really ready for that next step. And working together with professional development and learning and development, I've now am in the role of project officer learning and development with AIGI. So getting to work with lots of different organizations across the country around tailoring governance workshops um, for them. So yeah, super excited to join today and I'll also be able to run through some success stories of organisations that we've worked with in the past. Thanks, Abby. Hi everyone, thanks so much for having us. Um, my name's Elise. I'm a proud Wiradjuri woman um, who grew up and has spent most of my life on uh, Wobbicool land, beautiful Wobbicool land in Newcastle in New South Wales. Um, but today I'm fortunate enough to be dialing in from uh, Bunurong land. Um, I am the learning and development coordinator at AIGI, but at the moment am spending uh, the vast majority of my time updating um, and repurposing our uh, Indigenous governance toolkit so you'll I'm sure you'll see some of that today so just making sure that that's the most up-to-date and useful resource that it can be for all of you um, and then once that's done 
looking at um, how we can create the most beneficial learning opportunities for different groups um, to engage with that toolkit uh, alongside Abby and Jess. Um, I also worked at Career Trackers with Abby and Jess as well. So we've known each other for quite some time um, and have uh, experience in um, organisational development or workforce planning um, in my local council as well. Um, but traditionally come from a background in finance, um, but just really wanted to have more of a direct impact on community. So um, didn't last in the financial sector quite as long as I thought that I would when I was young and ambitious, um, but I'm really excited to be here. So thanks for having me. Thanks, Elise. And um, although this is not supposed to be about how deadly am I, but um, you guys will have clued into my um, career goal in that um, my goal is to hire and inspire um, deadly young talent so that when I get old, they'll employ me. Um, so you'll sort of see, you know, my team, sometimes I've worked with them in the past. Anywho, I'm going to share my screen um, and bear with me. I've got two screens going. So sometimes you sort of, you'll get this random spreadsheet over there that wasn't what I meant to share. We'll see how I go. All right, now you should get a slideshow, yeah? And if I just press that button, you get the slide itself, not the background, yeah? Yeah, sweet, I see a thumbs up. Thanks very much for that. And I'm also just gonna press this gallery button so that I still see all of you. Okay, sweet. Um, I just wanted to start with talking about who we are as an organization. Um, our purpose at AIGI is to strengthen self-determined governance with Indigenous peoples and nations. And we do that practically in a number of ways. Um, I'll talk a bit more about each of those in a moment. We are a not-for-profit. Uh, we're a non-government organisation and we were incorporated in 2012. AIGI really came about um, through years of research and really working out that Indigenous governance as a concept is, you know, to use academic sort of language and emerging discourse that is different to leadership, so of course connected, but different to leadership, different to reconciliation, again, of course connected, but um, a, a different concept. And so um, actually our founding board were folks who were involved with both the boards of Reconciliation Australia and the Australian Indigenous Leadership Centre and saw the need for a separate institute, the AIGI, and so started AIGI in 2012. Our strategy is really straightforward. What we really care about is governance resources. And so that is creating things like fact sheets, um, but also the Indigenous Governance Toolkit, which I'll talk a bit more about um, as well. We, we really care about capability strengthening. That is these sorts of things, is sharing our research, sharing the knowledge, sharing the stories of success, strengthening governance capability uh, with those that, that our, our, um, our offering reaches. We're also very um, focused on partnerships. We don't want to reinvent things. We don't want to duplicate effort. We want to work with organisations that have similar values and aspirations and, and do that work together. And of course, we're also very focused on sustainability and not just sustainability of impact, because that's very important, but also sustainability as an institute ourselves in that, you know, while we are a not-for-profit, I always um, like to use the phrase that we're also a not-for-loss and that in our sustainability efforts, we're also developing our um, capacity to deliver a, a to, to build our own source revenue and to work with organisations um, who can contract us in a way to do more longer term, tailored professional development work and advisory work. Really practically, though, what, what we do, um, as I said, it's about resource building, research, building the evidence base um, and the Indigenous Governance Toolkit is a web resource that um, I'll flick ahead and then flick back. It looks like this um, and the pane on the right hand side that gives you all of the topics as a bit of an idea of um, the things that are covered. As Elise mentioned at the moment, what we're doing is we're redeveloping that. We are um, updating it. We're consolidating different areas making it less, you know, less headings, um, making it easier to navigate. Gradually over time, you'll also see some new video content, some new graphic content, as we then um, update the governance stories of success that are in there as well. 
As I mentioned before, we also um, are focused on professional development. So things like um, organisations will get in touch with us and say, hey, can you come out and go through director's duties or we've, we're thinking about succession planning. Can you come and help us map that out? Or we want to get youth involved. Can you come and run a workshop on engaging our youth? So various things like that. We're developing um, our ability to do that. Over the years, 10 years, as I said, the organisation has been focused on research and resource building, and that's building that evidence base, very, very important. Um, now what we want to do is do both those things at the same time, focus on building the resources, but also on the deployment of those resources so that uh, we can reach more audiences. We also care about advocacy, things like the CATSI Act. When that's um, up for review, we will submit, we'll, we'll put submissions in toward that uh, and various other pieces of legislation. Law reform is really important to us. We're also um, starting to work in the area of programs because while we've been very focused on research, we care a lot about professional development and advisory work. Uh, also interested at the moment to look at what are the programmatic elements around perhaps mentoring or board observership that could be relevant to the communities that we care about. So looking into that space at the moment. You also may know our name from the Indigenous Governance Awards, um, the IGAs, and um, that program we, de we deliver with Reconciliation Australia. It's delivered every two years. The schedule's gone a little bit out of whack um, in the last couple of years because of COVID, uh, but um, that's a really important piece of work that we're involved in, and it's important because it allows us to find and share the stories of success and solution so that others can learn from that as well. As I mentioned before, that's the toolkit. Um, I'll talk a little bit about our approach Really important to us is, as I said before, talking about the toolkit, evidence-based in that everything we're doing, you know, we can talk to, if we're going to talk to you about customising governance, we can talk to you about an example of an organisation who's customised their governance. Um, very important that we're based in literature and uh, examples of, of real world success. Strengths-based is very important. We're also familiar with a deficit way of thinking about Indigenous people. That's not how we want to operate very focused on solutions and that workshop mode. I like to share this picture. This is um, recently we ran a Youth in Governance Masterclass um, in Brisbane. And this is the group of folks that were along for the day, very workshop focused scenarios, get involved, that sort of thing, solutions focused. And of course, also celebrating indigenous ways of knowing um, and doing. And um, forgive me for the lots of text at the bottom there. I've just thrown that in to remind myself to mention that we're of course very aware that we use the term indigenous. We also use the term Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander, but we're really aware and acknowledge and respect that um, different terms are preferred in different jurisdictions and locations, and and that may vary. Um, and, and you know, to be if if you sort of if it's not a common term for you to use, and and it's a term I've used, I um, respect and apologise for the for the difference um, the differences that are among all of us in the way that we think about and use terms. All right, let's talk about this word governance. And now when I say the word governance, I think that, you know, we're so off we go to governance training. Oh, there's a governance webinar. Governance sounds a lot like government. And so I thought, let's just start with establishing what on earth do we mean by governance? And then what do we mean by Indigenous governance? We'll come to that um, next, because what we're trying to do today is talk about and unpack this idea of two-way governance and how the design of governance can be and should be informed by the people that your organisation or your group exists for. So when we think about governance, here's a really dictionary sort of definition. It's how people choose to organise themselves, to manage affairs, to share power and responsibility, decide for themselves what kind of society they want and to implement those decisions. Pretty dictionary-ish sort of definition somewhat helpful. If we break it down a little bit more, governance is just the way that people organise themselves because there's a shared goal. And so governance is not something that somebody does on their own. It is a, it's because there's a shared goal. And so really simply, governance is the art of group work. 
I find that to be um, a real, you know, when sometimes when we deal with these words that are sort of overused and, you know, they're, they're sort of, they're used all the time, you think, well, hang on a minute, what does it even mean? The, I think the, the, the best way to think about governance is that um, it's about group work. We then start to unpack uh, two-way governance. And so if you think about as whether you are on the board of or you're a leadership team member, a staff member, whether it's in whether you sort of come today with your in your mind your day job, or whether you think, hang on a minute, I've got my day job, like me, I've got my day job, and then um, in my community, I might be part of a committee or on a board, or we have lots of different roles. Um, and when we think of, uh, about two-way governance, what we're talking about is your people, so the, the people that your organisation serves, probably in this context, they're that those forms of accountability, whether we're talking about law, as in L-O-R-E, but it's rules, culture and values, all of the forms of accountability of your people. We're also then aware of the wider governance environment. So whether or not you are um, incorporated under ORIC or ASIC or maybe state legislation, those are forms of accountability. So what we're talking about here is two different forms of accountability, laws, rules, regulations, things that uh, influence the way you operate, be two different forms of accountability. For Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander organisations, we operate in the middle and that's inherently contentious. It's difficult. It's a balancing act. And thinking about that and thinking, oh, gosh, actually the work that we do to design governance and to customise governance that responds to both those forms of accountability, that's really difficult work. And even just to start with celebrating and acknowledging that that, that is difficult work, but it's so important. And all of the research, all of the work that we've done with governance awards, with all of the stories that we've, we've written for the toolkit, um, everything tells us that um, organisations are, are most successful when they're able to hold both of those forms of accountability as they design and implement their governance. I really love this quote. It's a Mick Gooder quote from the Social Justice Report. It's a few years old now, um, but I really think that it just distills what two-way governance, thinking about those two forms of accountability are. And so what we're talking about is not just blackfellas learning how to do Western governance. We're not talking about that, although understanding Western governance is important in order to hold both those forms of accountability in the way you operate. But in fact, what we're talking about is the way that contemporary Indigenous governance is about working with traditional governance and traditional uh, values, customs, ways of doing things um, and responding effectively to the wider governance environment. At AIGI, we think of governance in these eight areas or eight elements, and it's a very much whole of organisation approach. So we're thinking about, okay, all of the things that make you who you are, and that is the stuff in the lighter green at the top, your purpose, your people, your culture, your wider environment. We think of that as your context. You know how somebody says, oh, let me give you some context and, and it's let me tell you a bit more about that. So your context is all of the stuff that makes you who you are. And then the stuff at the bottom, that's the content. And so we're really thinking about the structure of your organisation, the strategy you have in place, the rules or processes that set you up for what you do, the resources that you have in place, all of those things are, are the content of your governance model. And so this is just a way of thinking about it. It's a framework. It doesn't assume that we have any knowledge of um, individual communities. You know, whenever I'm talking to a group of people, I'm always very careful to say and very respectful to say that AIGI or, or me, we're not experts on your community. We're not experts on your people. We're not experts on your governance either. That 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 um, expertise exists within the community. 
what we try to do is offer a framework or a lens or a way of thinking about and organizing the work that you might do to strengthen your governance. So it's simply offered as a, as a way of thinking, a way of planning perhaps. The next couple of slides give you a little bit more detail on each of those things. It's quite obvious, I think, so I won't sort of talk at you and labor on it too much. I wanna to get to the point where we get you talking a little bit and get a bit more activity based. Um, but what I wanted to do first of all is establish this sort of, you know, common um, common knowledge around well, governance and the way that um, we think it's useful to, to approach it. So of course your purpose is that, that thing that brings you together. The people is the people in, in your governance is, is the who, and the culture is the way that you do things. So culture as in the culture, you know, a school has a culture, a, um, a team has a culture, but also the Aboriginal or Torres Strait Islander culture um, that is relevant to your organisation, that is, is relevant to the people that you serve or to the community that you serve. And then, of course, the wider environment is the, the outside stuff that you need to, you need to think about, whether that's um, other organisations or communities, networks, government regulators and so on. And so those things are the context. We then think about, okay, the content is the structure, the rules, that the how you do it, your strategies, as in what you do, and then the resources, what you need, whether it's funding, infrastructure, it might be technology, it might be natural assets, it might be your, your um, the people, those are the resources. And so those things are thought of as the content. Um, and, and, and the way that we sort of, you know, out the sort of the, the way to frame this is to think, well, okay, how can all of the things to do with my context, all of those things we spoke about back here, all of those things, how can my purpose, my people, the culture, the wider environment, how do those things inform the design of the governance model? And that is the content um, of structure, the rules, the strategies, and so on. And when thinking about all of those things, what we've found is that when all of those things are working well, an organisation can then look to principles to embed um, effective governance. The principles that we use to define effective governance are these. Um, so thinking about is your governance customised? So that means is the model designed for your specific purpose, for your environment and your resources? Is it culturally legitimate? Does it match your members or communities ways of doing things? Does it evolve? Does it adapt over time when there are changes? And is it accountable, that two-way accountability we spoke about before, as in the people who your governance serves have a say in your governance design? And so each year we, um, every second year when we're involved with the Indigenous Governance Awards, when we are detailing the stories of success from those organisations, we find that these principles uh, ring true across all of them, that those organisations are doing these things. And so um, suggest these ways of thinking about, in, about Indigenous governance is when organisations are thinking about these principles and implementing these principles, we see um, we see success. I might take a breath. I'm sort of talking at you a little bit here. Um, I want to talk to you about an organisation called Purple House, and then I'll get you guys um, talking. I hope that's going to be okay. I don't know. Like, um, I think, oh gosh, I just don't want to talk at you for 90 minutes. But at the same time, I know that sometimes I'm guilty of putting a webinar on and then going and doing the dishes with my headphones in and screen off and walking away. So. Uh, we'll see how we go. Perhaps we'll get some people um, who want to have a chat. Um, we'll see how we go. But first of all, I wanted to start um, by telling you about Purple House. And some of you might know of Purple House. Um, they're an incredible organisation based in Alice Springs who um, are have been around for more than 20 years. And they are focused on getting dialysis um, services to remote communities so that um, people who need to be on dialysis because if you're on dialysis it's three days a week for the rest of your life so that people on dialysis um, can receive that that um, 
that medicine on on country and so the reason I mentioned Purple House is they received an Indigenous Governance Award a few years back and what's really extraordinary about Purple House is how they have brought the cultural values of the communities that they care about into their governance model and into the way that they do things. What I'm hoping to do is tell you about how they did that and then get you thinking about how your cultural values might inform your governance model and would, um, I intended to chuck people in breakout rooms, but with a small group, perhaps we won't do that. Perhaps we'll just do a, um, a bit more of an open chat and invite people to speak. Um, we'll do that in a couple of minutes. Let me talk a little bit more about Purple House. So what you see on the screen is their values. And this is outlined in their strategic plan. They have been very um, thoughtful about their values and how those values of the people that they care about are embedded into their governance. And so if you think the ones I've, high, I've, I've bolded um, are the ones that you can see really clearly through the example I'm about to show you. So they say we'll be strong and clever and brave and determined to make life better for our people. And so if that's your value, then you go, oh, hang on, how am I going to make sure that value comes through to the way that we do things? Um, for example, as well, we'll think deeply, we'll plan wisely, and we'll take action to support patient agency, enhance well-being, and maintain dignity. And so if you take those two examples, what they've then done is they've been really clear also in their strategic plan and made it clear to their community that they'll use those values um, to make sure that that they're, the way that they do things, like how they make decisions and how they share information, is informed by those values that are that are, that have come from their cultural values. Of course, also ensuring that family, dreaming, and country are central to all that we do and say. Um, and so, if you look at this example, then. What they've gone and done is they've gone, okay, when we make decisions, what we'll do is we'll meet in Alice so that the patients are able to attend. We're going to, our meetings are going to be open to all dialysis patients and family members. The meetings will go for two days to give enough time to present information. They also then um, make sure that um, they attend the board meetings of other organisations to regularly present reports of progress at other organisations so that they're sharing with other organisations in the community. And, you know, if you look then back at the set of values, you can see think deeply, plan wisely, take action to support patient agency. It's really clear how they've gone and thought about how their cultural values are then embedded into the way that they do things. So then if we use the concept of elements of governance to look at what Purple House have done, well, what they've done is they've taken their cultural values and they've embedded those in the rules of the organisation and how they do things. So then this is where I was going to ask you guys to have a bit of a think and a bit of a share. Um, using this example as, as food for thought, how can you use your context to customise your governance model? And so I wanted to get you guys thinking about your values or the cultural values that um, are important in your work and how do they then inform something like your policies and procedures, the roles and responsibilities, the processes of the organisation. So I might just stop there and open up um, what are the values of your organisation, what, what are the things that um, jump to mind as we talk about values that can be embedded in your governance model. Open to anybody who'd like to share. It's always hard to be the first person. And look, I don't know, you know, as I said, sometimes we sort of do the webinar and oh, I don't want to share, but also just thought, oh gosh, how do I not talk at you for so long? Um, I know. Get you guys sharing. It's a hard balance, you. isn't it? Especially online. Do you want to have some values to share? Or maybe just even, I mean, doesn't have to be specific to, you know, my attempt at an activity. Um, 
how's what we're talking about so far resonating with you? You know, are you sort of thinking, oh yeah, I see, I see that we do that. Um, anything that you think would be helpful or interesting to share with the rest of the group? I can see a passing of a mouse and possibly someone taking themselves off mute. I think that's what I can see is happening. Hi everyone. So um, we're Calwyn. Um, so we're on the Gold Coast here. So I suppose for us it's around, um, you know, working for our community, ensuring that our community has, um, you know, we talk about long, healthy lives and all of our work within Cowan, although we have different sections of Cowan, that's our goal. So we, you know, basically, and it's around the lifespan of our, you know, our community and our people. Um, one thing that we, uh, within the division that I uh, work in is we do a lot of around family and cultural protocols. Mm -hmm. um, so in decision making, um, you know, whilst we're meeting a outside or an external requirement to develop plans with families, we're also ensuring that within that development of those plans, we have our own, you know, our cultural protocols, our families' cultural protocols, um, and ensuring that, you know, their voices are heard. So. Um, you know, it comes from a community point of view. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing. Can, is there an example of a protocol that you actively have in place that you sort of you're using all the time? Um, so definitely um, around um, families, but also community, um, you know, decision making and um, that involvement of ensuring that, um, you know, family has a voice and community has a voice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, awesome. Thanks for sharing. Would anyone else like to share? Hi, um, I'm Beck Williams. I'm, um, I don't know if my camera is working. Oh, it is. Um, oh, yeah, I'll see you. Hi, how are you? Um, I'm the Practice Quality Business Partner for Mission Australia. Um, so my, yes, <laughs> so my role is to look at national policies and frameworks that are threaded through our service delivery um, teams throughout Australia. I primarily support Queensland and our services um, that are in Queensland. So that ranges from like Mornington Island um, down to Southeast Brisbane. I'm probably in um, a really unique space at the moment is that I'm actually working with our reconciliation action on our reconciliation action plan um, stage. And one of that is looking through at us a culturally secure um, framework um, and also practice guidelines. So it's really interesting how we're going about pulling that. It feels um, we've just prior to this, we just had a rap champion. So we have rap champions. Um, and that they're out there um, looking at changes that we can make within the organisation um, to make uh, staff um, feel um, uh, they can, they can the, a whole range of different things. So it'd be too, too much to go into, but it's working really effectively having um, First Nations people actually on the champions group. Um, when it comes to our policies and procedures, when we actually have a, we have a consultation process and what we'll be doing is um, with our service delivery mainly is what I primarily look at, but there's also our people in culture team, our workplace health and safety, a whole range of things. We're actually putting them up through a reconciliation um, a, a um, knowledge group mm -hmm. um, that comprises solely of um, First Nations people. Um, and so that's been really good. Um, and we've, you know, we're learning a lot more, um, but it's also changing. We've just had our first First Nations um, board appointment mm -hmm. for the organisation. So that's been um, really um, something that has one of our values is celebration. So that's been something that we've been celebrating. But we're actually finding um, that it's um, through looking at all the different elements that make up frameworks, which includes governance, we still have a long way to go to actually capture um, staff voice, um, but which will also thread into, we're very good at capturing client voice, but how do we sort of blend the two together through our documentation um, for staff? So it's quite an interesting program and um, one that lots of learning 
um, mm. and information mm. sharing. And it's been really, really good um, to be invited to participate in that program. Mm. Yeah, thanks for sharing. And it's interesting, you know, I think more and more we're seeing organisations, particularly non-Indigenous organisations that have an Indigenous focus, trying to work out how in a fair and equitable and respectful way you amplify voice and you know it's tricky work um but it's it's important that it sounds like it, you know you're really approaching it with with really good intentions and you're really making good good progress um we'll get um uh, we'll talk a little bit more a bit further on about um our UI which um, Mob on the Gold Coast there might know as well as the um, Institute for Urban Indigenous Health who are based in Brisbane. Um, they've also been profiled in the Indigenous Governance Awards a few years back for their um, work in growing their own and the way that they bring a cultural integrity framework into their um, recruitment and retention. So there's lots of, you know, um, examples and, and things to look out for um, that, that already exist, you know, that can that can inform the work you're doing as well. But thanks for sharing, uh, Beck. I wonder now, Stacey, if I just click next, am I, am I still sharing or did we unshare? No, we wanted to see your lovely face. So we stopped sharing your screen. But you can share again now if you want to pop back into your um, presentation. And All we'll right, just make sure attend. that we have the full screen um, when you share. Let's see how we go. I wonder how that goes. Does that work? It has worked. The only thing is it's on your presenter mode, so we can also see your notes. Oh, which are just so random and not like. I wonder, <laughs> like, because I copy and paste slides from elsewhere, so it's like it's not like that's what I'm reading at all. Um, I wonder how I do that. Hmm. There must be. Is it in way. display? Oh, settings? maybe. Spend. If you're not worried about actually having the notes, it might not. I don't need the notes. Yeah, no, you can. Just... I think you, if you press that, let's see what happens. Anyway. Does that take it away? What has that done now? It hasn't done anything on. No, it hasn't it's done anything. On mine. Oh, that's so weird. It was a bit of a stitch up, wasn't it? A button that doesn't do anything. I wonder what these. I think if you go back to the display settings and you okay. click the next selection. Do you so there's two. Yeah, let's just see what happens when you do that. What does that do? Oh, screen sharing has stopped. Oh, goodness huh? me. <laughs> I think, um, let me just see how I go here. Hang on. What's that done now? Is that the whole slide? Yeah, yeah that's yeah, perfect. I just shared again and look. There we there go. We go. Sometimes um, you just start again. That's it. <laughs> sorry about that, folks. No, not at all. Um, so what I've done here, sorry, um, I'll skip through these because after our good chat, they probably won't make that much sense now. I've sort of come up with a few maybe really common things that might be part of um, the values of an organisation. So if you think of, okay, maybe a value could be to respect the knowledge of our elders. Maybe it's about our decisions benefiting our community. They might be really common ones. Um, how would you then, so in a longer session with a bigger group, um, we might have gone into, okay, how would you, to really follow that Purple House example through, how would those values translate into your governance rules, such as how you make decisions and how you share information. But perhaps that's something that, you know, if you're thinking, oh, this is good content, I might sort of have a chat with the team. This is the sort of thing where our hope is that, you know, you see something that get, that sparks an idea or a conversation and you can quite easily take away an idea we've given you and use that as a team discussion or something that sort of, you know, gets your team thinking about this sort of stuff. Um, I wanted to mention IUI um, and love a couple of pictures of um, things happening in person. I'm still sort of in that mode of like, whenever we do something in person, think, oh my God, get all the photos, you know, because um, it's been such a, yeah, interesting sort of, you know, come back um, to getting out and doing things in person. But Abby, um, tell us about this slide. Yeah, cool. So 
IUE, which is the Institute for Urban Indigenous Health, is a community controlled health service that leads the planning, development and delivery of health, family, wellbeing and social support services to Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander population of South East Queensland. So IUE was a joint winner for an Indigenous Governance Award in 2018 responding to the health gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples in South East Queensland. IUE was established. So based in Brisbane, IUE came into fruition in 2009 and has been growing ever since. IUE's philosophy is further, faster, better and has exemplified this throughout their practice. IUE have been able to make the biggest single health impact of any Indigenous organisation in Australia in the shortest time period and with the national best practice standard of care. When winning the IGA, IUE had a total of 35,000 clients and had grown by 340% since 2009. So the development of a workforce for Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander health delivery is a key priority for IUE. IUE's workforce development strategy aims to equip the existing primary health care workforce to roll out the IUE model of care and to build the workforce of the future through traineeships and student placements. IUE works closely with member services to systematically map the roles and functions of current primary health care staff. This enables staff roles to be aligned to the IUE model of care and clear direction for staff training needs. So all new staff participate in a three-day orientation program conducted monthly. Of note is that all existing staff also progressively attend the orientation as a way of fostering reinvigorated internal organisational culture across the IUE network. A key component is ensuring that all staff have an understanding of and commitment to the IUE's cultural integrity investment framework, which you can kind of see um, in the, one of the images, the way statement verse. So definitely pop on their website and you can have a look at it um, more clearly if you can't read it all in the image, but that's there on the right. Um, so the cultural integrity investment framework, having all staff operating from a common cultural reference point, transforms how staff see, understand, do and belong. The IUE is committed to growing its own leadership, so really focusing on succession planning. So selected staff are invited to be observers at each board and senior management meetings. The IUE Emerging Indigenous Leaders Program is specifically designed to support young Indigenous employees on a pathway to management and leadership positions. The IUE has engaged the majority of its management team in a peer coaching program that supports small groups to reflect on their managerial and leadership practices around specific themes. This is complemented by um, targeted training courses for the middle and senior management teams. You can also see in the other images, um, Carver Watson, the General Manager of Family Health and Wellbeing Services at IUE, he's delivering a governance workshop earlier this year to our previous cohort of award recipients um, and nominees. So kind of going through, he was being able to reflect on IUE's journey um, and the, yeah, their growth and obviously the framework and what they're put into place and was able to share that with this year's current recipient. So those are, that's Carver there delivering the workshop um, around the governance training and around IUE to, yeah, this year's finalists. Thanks, Abby. And maybe just to recap as well, um, what we've been talking about today is some stories of organisations like IUE and Purple House where um, governance has been customised and really thought about and designed in a way that, um, as I was saying really at the beginning, it, that holds um, forms of accountability that is the forms of accountability of the group that you serve and, and also of the wider environment. So hopefully some of those examples start to sort of spark your thinking about you know, how, how these organisations are informed um, by the people that they exist for and, you know, to reflect on like with the great example shared um, 
before to reflect on how you're doing that. And, and even if you go away from today just thinking, hey, we do that too, or we do that in more ways or in a different way or a different way that's special, um, e even if you sort of, you know, don't think of a new way to inform your governance model, um, but, but give yourselves an opportunity to celebrate and acknowledge the way that you already do that, um, that's a win for us. I wanted to also talk to you, oh, I put that slide in there, forgot about it. Um, those are the Governance Awards publications of the last few. There's the 2016 one and the 2018 one there, the 2021, um, which is even though we're in 2022, we've just done the 2020 awards um, earlier this year. So the 2020 publication um, doesn't exist yet, but these are the last couple. And that's where the IUE story is. The Purple House stories in one of these as well, and many, many other stories um, about how organisations are succeeding in their gov in designing and delivering a governance model that is informed and and culturally inform and culturally legitimate in, in the way that it's designed. I wanted to um, finish well. The last sort of topic I'll I'll talk about. Um, I think we had an hour and a half in in the diary, but. We'll see how we go. You might end up with a little bit of time left back in given back to you today. Um, but I wanted to, as the last topic to talk about with you guys, talk about this concept of a health check. And um, we've been dealing, we've been thinking through how we will do this at AIGI in terms of self-assessment, diagnostic, all those, all these words. To be honest with you, I don't really like any of the words. Um, but these are the words that are used, you know. So say, for example, even, you know, with us, we received some support from a consultant recently and before they helped us with uh, the piece of work that we pitched, they did a diagnostic on us to sort of understand, you know, where our strengths and weaknesses as an organisation are so that they could go, oh, yeah, okay, we understand you now. This is how we might work with you. The concept, you know, you, different words are used, concepts the same, right? The idea is that, if you have an an ideal or a goal, so in our case, the way that we frame a self-assessment or a health check is we say, okay, well, if the aspiration for effective governance is that that governance is evolving, customised, culturally legitimate and, to, and, and is accountable two ways, if those are the principles, right, think about this as if that's the goal that we wish to achieve, aspire to, then how might we, forgetting for example, forgetting what word is best, um, there are lots of examples out there. You know, if you're a member of the AICD, for example, you can get on there and do yourself a self-assessment tool and it will tell you then which courses that, that you might um, want to do depending on how you assessed yourself in terms of your governance strengths and weaknesses, right? So these things are not, this concept is not new. Um, it exists in many forms across the wider governance environment. But the reason I wanted to talk about it today is to just offer the concept to you in its real general form to see if then it becomes something that you could take away as a real general concept to utilise in various contexts that you might be in, whether you're on a board, a leadership team member, a staff member, in whatever um, context that might be relevant to you. So if we think about this, concept of a, of a check, a pulse check, health check, whatever you want to call it, the idea is to go, okay, well, if my aspiration is to have a governance model that is customised, what could I ask myself in order to get a read on how we're going against that principle? I'll give you a couple of examples and it'll make a bit more sense. So say, for example, we're talking about two-way accountability, being accountable. That is um, the when we talk about accountable, what we mean is the people who your governance serves has a, have a say in your governance design priorities and strategy. So if that's the goal, right, is that we know that if, you know, we want to be a, a really effective organisation for our people, we're going to seek to be accountable and ensure that um, our people have a say in the design priorities and strategy and so on. So then how do you know? How do you know if you are doing that? And what I've just popped up here is a couple of suggested questions. So if I'm thinking about this in an organisation that I'm on the board of, I could go, okay, does the organisation have Indigenous people in leadership positions with decision-making power? Yes or no? Why or why not? And how might we move toward that in order to 
get closer to being really effectively accountable? Does the organisation encourage community participation? The example that these guys shared before, absolutely. Does the organisation seek and act on feedback it receives, even when it's uncomfortable? So you can start to see that just this, you know, I sort of, I don't want to bang on about it too much, but regardless of, you know, what org has a self-assessment or a health check, you know, even um, Justice Connect, really great organisation, you can do a governance health check with them, very legal focused, but very good resource, right? They, they're all, they're, there's different models out there. But the concept, when you pair it right back, anybody can take the concept, come up with a couple of questions and set themselves on a path to thinking about how to strengthen their governance. Take also the example of culturally legitimate. Does culture, so if to be culturally legitimate, the way that we're defining that is, to, is that your governance matches your members or communities or nations' ways of doing things, right? Matches is informed by culture. Does culture play an important role in the organisation, in the function of the organisation? Are there examples that you can think of where the community or region's cultural values, relationships, considerations, priorities were embedded in governance model and processes in really practical ways? Does the organisation actively develop future leaders? And so you can see some of the examples that we shared, Purple House, IUI, you can see that if they were answering these questions, you can imagine their responses where our examples have been um, sort of connected to these ideas. And so I just wanted to offer that as an idea, as a concept, this concept of a health check, you know, in any, <coughs> excuse me, in any context that you're in, you can go, okay, what is it that we're trying to achieve here? What are some questions that we can ask ourselves that'll give us a real, you know, sense of how we're doing? And then with that knowledge is the power to then go, okay, what could we do to strengthen our work in each of these areas? So I just wanted to offer that as a really general way of thinking about strengthening governance by doing a, a bit of a, a self-assessment. And then to just leave that slide up. I was thinking, um, I'm just thinking about time. We're at 2.30. We did have more time scheduled in. What I would have done at this point is um, gotten you guys, I was just thinking, you know, if we were a bigger group, this was my intention, you tell me whether or not. Um, if we're a bigger group, what I was going to do was put you into breakout rooms. And so what I've done there is given examples of questions that allow you to think about cultural legitimacy and accountability, I was then going to say, well, what questions would you, to take the other two that I haven't given an example of, what questions would you come up with for knowing if you're, uh, how you're going against a governance model that's evolving or a governance model that's customised? Um, but thinking that maybe might just be a good idea to offer that as an idea um, that people might want to take away as a, you know, as a, as an activity to to strengthen governance in there are in in your own contexts rather than sort of throw you into an activity. Just checking in with you, Stacey. What do you think? Yeah, sure. I'm I'm happy. Well, what we'll do is in the post event email we'll be uh, linking the toolkit, which has some of these different templates and resources available in it. So Jess, I'm I can also thinking, share this slideshow as well. Yeah, great. Okay. So if, if you have more content to go through, I'm not sure how many more slides you might have, Just happy for you to continue through that if you would like to. But by the um, same token, if anyone would like to jump in and share something now, really happy for that conversation just to organically happen. Maybe we'll do a check-in with, with the group. Does anyone want to say something at this point? It's always hard to know whether people are going to want to engage in a webinar sort of format. Um, but no, this is um, this was our, our intention was to talk about two way governance, talk about principles of effective governance, tell those couple of stories around Purple House and IUE, point the team to um, to the resources, um, to those stories of success publications as a, a place where there are many more stories like the two that we shared. Um, uh, the activity there around values, the activity around um, principles here that we were going to do, that that's really um, what we plan to do. So um, 
happy to to sort of sum up and um, and you know thank everybody for the time, um, but also really um, happy to to hear more from the group as well if if there's the interest to share. Well, was there any anything to share? Any questions from the group about any of the content that's been? I might stop presented? sharing too. Yeah, sure. Any questions, comments? Well, we might then say thanks and and wrap up. Um, yeah, sure, not a problem. It's okay, not, it's okay not to participate as well, you know. Um, yeah, it can be hard to tell how um, how much people want to share and, and engage in this sort of webinar scenario, but always try and offer the opportunity to do it because really, really value peer learning. And in any scenario, you know, um, I really believe this is the teacher in me is that particularly the folks of you that have joined as a group today, you know, you might go away and have a chat about these things. Um, and even if you, you know, if you agree or disagree or say, oh, I liked what they said about this, but oh, what I would say is this and oh, in our context, you know, what you talk to each other about after a, a, an opportunity like this. Um, is often more valuable than anything that we show you or we talk to you about. You know, that peer um, learning is really valuable and something that I think is important um, to call out as well. So um, mm. I'll look out. I see the mouse move. <laughs> oh, no, I didn't, uh, sorry. I didn't know. Whether, <laughs> I didn't know whether that was going to be an unmute. Yeah, um, I thought you were going to say something. Uh, oh, Sam, Sam's in the chat saying something. Housing Choices, it's just starting to, um, out on a resident voices project. So this has been a really great start to get me oh. thinking. Oh, good. Okay. Um, well, that's good. Um, often we we connect with so many different sectors. You just don't know where, um, you know, where it's going to, where it's going to be valuable. So that's really lovely to hear. Thanks for sharing that. Sam. Look, we'll say thanks and, and farewell, um, QCOS mob. Thanks for having us. I hope that's been really, hope that's been useful. Um, we're also really keen for your feedback as well. If you wanted to, yeah, drop us a, yeah if at any point you wanted to drop us a note, just really um, open minded and, and humble about learning. We have a really, um, oh, look out, here's a governance poll. Yeah, we're, we're, re we're really swish around here. Here's a, <laughs> here's a, here's a feedback. Awesome, yeah. Let us know because, um, look, Jess and her team and um, us here at QGOS will continue discussing um, even into the new year what opportunities there might be to um, address some of the challenges and share some of their learnings as an organisation. They've, they've done a lot of work and, and as they've mentioned, they're reviewing the, um, the toolkit at the moment. Um, so plenty of resources and content to discuss um, into the new year. We'd be really happy to get your ideas about particular things you'd like to see unpacked um, because we will work together to see what we can uh, make happen together in the new Thanks. year so yeah and, and Thanks, as Sophie, i mentioned I, i've forgotten we did that that's awesome i love <laughs> yeah. that please, please click on the poll yeah yeah let us know um so that we can make sure um our next uh, webinar is really useful for you. Um, we've been chatting about a few topics for the new th new year including things like um you know just um you might remember we talked about succession planning involving youth in um, governance roles and some and some stuff around roles and responsibilities. So we'll continue those discussions. Um, so watch this space. We'll let you know. If you've registered for this uh, webinar, it means we've got your email address. So you'll be hearing from us again. Um, and we'll send out the post event email with the slides, uh, a link to the governance toolkit, which has, if you haven't already had a look at it, it's got some really tangible resources in there, some really useful content. So recommend you have a thorough read through that, that resource. Thanks okay. everyone for your time. Thank you so much, Jess, Abby, Elise, uh, for your time. Um, and we, we hope to see you all again soon.